Good morning. I am Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and I'm here today on April 3rd to, for my weekly live cast. I actually did a short live cast earlier this week on April 1st. That's when we sent our e newsletter this month because we wanted it to coincide with April Fool's Day. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in this live cast. And this live cast might be a little bit shorter than normal because, you know, I already talked about some of the things that we talked about in that previous live cast. But I'm here to hang out, of course, to answer any questions you have and to, um, to discuss random topics. Yeah, some some random stuff going on. It's still my games here. I've been working on what well, I did a play test this past weekend of a game. Uh, I'm working on the rule book for another game. And yeah, maybe mostly some some rule book stuff with with one game that I'm working on. Um, but yeah, yeah, I hope you're what 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 are your creative pursuits right now? I know I talk a lot about what we're creating at Stillmeyer Games, but uh, what are you what are you working on creatively right now? What are you what are you actively creating or working towards creating right now? I also have another question of the day related to a topic that I'd like to cover on a video sometime. But yeah, I'm curious to hear what you're creating right now. Ian just chimed in. Ian says Ian has been working on over multiple live casts trying to beat Wormspan Ultima level three, and he finally did it with a big. Uh, victory there, one twelve to ninety nine. Well done, Ian. Congratulations on doing that. That's a that's a that's a big deal. Yeah, well done. Uh, Wingspan or Wormspan did have its retail release on March 29th. So last Friday was its worldwide English retail release. I think some localized versions of it also released on that day. And it's been really exciting to see retailers around the world cover the game and have photos of it. I posted I posted a bunch of those stories to my Instagram feed at Jamie Stegmeyer. But uh, I hope if you have been wanting a copy of Wormspan that you now have access to it in any way that you want access to it, whether it's from our web store, from an online store, from Amazon, or your local store, or Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble has done a lot of publicity for Wormspan, which we really appreciate. They've paired it with some dragon-themed books, which I think is a neat, neat way to, to talk about the game. YYZ says, usually the first live stream of the month is for some product news. Anything for April besides the chocolate, or will the next one be in May? Um, so yeah, well, let me talk about the chocolate first because we do still have the chocolate and I'll share my other screen here, but I do have the chocolate in front of me. So our April Fool's treat this month was uh, was chocolate. So this was our product of the month. It isn't technically a product that we're selling, but we partnered with a local chocolatier called uh, Crown Candy Kitchen. And they made these custom chocolate bars themed around the idea of chocolate of the day. And so of course, this will be my chocolate of the day today. Uh, they come in packs of four or eight. So it's a little Stillmeyer Games cat-eared April Fool's logo with chocolate of the day on it. You can join me in a future live cast by having some chocolate while we're playing, uh, while we're talking here. Or you can use that your game night. I've heard of some people, some people picking up a few packs for their game night, which I think is awesome. But yeah, that is our product this month, this chocolate of the chocolate of the day from Crown Candy Kitchen here in St. Louis. Um, I'll show you another more close-up photo. Here's the more close-up photo. I'm going to take down your comment real quick. Uh, yeah, here is my other screen here. So here's what the chocolate of the day looks like. It's a four pack. This one came out of this pack right here. And it's really good creamy milk chocolate. I, I'm really enjoying it. And I, I, I really like the chocolate that comes from Crown Candy Kitchen. It only ships in the U.S. with flat rate shipping um, because it we uh, they, they don't ship internationally. And it would be really, really expensive to ship internationally. But so I'm sorry about that for all of our non-US followers, but it is available in the US right now. Um, that is our that is our product for April. And it we don't, so your question was a little bit like uh kind of insinuating that we have a new product every month. And we actually try to avoid having a new product every month. I, I try to respect your wallets essentially by only releasing a few products every year. And it might seem like more. I'm still out of focus here. I'm gonna try to get back in focus. Come on, focus. Um it might seem like more than that because we release Rolling Realms promos pretty much every other month or every two to three months. But uh, I try I try not to over-release things. I try to spread things out. Uh, respect that you respect your wallet. Respect that you have other companies whose products you also want. Um, so yeah, just chocolate this month. And I'm still out of focus. I've never quite figured out how to get this thing back into focus after holding something up to the screen. That's why I like having this other screen. Maybe if I wave, maybe wave the chocolate around over here. Come on, focus. You can do this. It came back on Monday when I did it. Hopefully it'll come back in a second. Sorry about that for now. 
I mentioned, I asked the question of what are you creating right now? What are you actively working on creating? Chad says he's working on custom fitted hat designs. It's for a pre-order company called The Clink Room. Designers make logos, submit them, and get a few picked out for a pre-order. Lots of fun for designers. That's really cool, Jad. Um, yeah, good luck with your, your hat design. That's a, that's a different pursuit. Luke is working on a mask. He's carving a mask, an area control game, and the rules for his trick-taking game. Nice variety of creative pursuits there. Muse and Metal is finishing up a rule book for Twisted Trumpets, which recently signed to a publisher. Congratulations on that. And is now working on a new card game about African drumming called Jembe. Awesome. Yeah. Great to hear you have some, some, uh, some fun game designs in the works. I'm still thrown off here because I'm out of focus. I'm out of focus for myself too, not just for you. Uh, let's see if I can, if I walk around for a second, will I, will I trick the camera into like finding my focus? Come on camera, you can do this. Uh, yeah, if anyone knows the trick for how to get the camera to refocus, let me know. Um, what else is going on? Uh, Ray says he is working on a board game idea. He's been stalling around. He stalled a little bit. He says, do you have any creative pursuits outside of board games or do board games simply occupy too much of your headspace to leave room for other stuff? That's kind of, that's kind of the truth there, Ray, the second part of it. Um, my, my two lifelong main creative pursuits have been designing board games and fiction writing, but I've kind of, and even though it isn't fictional, I kind of scratched that fiction writing itch by writing on my personal blog and the Stillmeyer Games blog. It definitely isn't the same, but I am still storytelling in, in a way through those blog entries. And so I really enjoy that. Um, and I do a fair amount of writing for our games as well. So those are my two main creative pursuits um, as of this time. And really with my, my job, even though it's board games, I also have, I, I create a, a you know pretty broad variety of content with Stillmeyer Games, including the blogs, including the, uh, the, the, the videos that I create. So they aren't, um, it's a form of content creation that I enjoy. I, my, my uh, co-founder actually is texting me right here in the middle of the live cast. I'll have to text them back after the live cast. All right, I am just annoyed now that I'm out of focus. I'm sorry, this is really distracting for me too. Let me see if I can try the hand thing again. See if that'll, there we go. It worked that time. Um, Let's see. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Alan know that I'm live right. He should know that I'm live at the same time every week. Um, what else is going on? I'm gonna scroll through and talk about your other creative pursuits in a second. I did want to ask the other uh, the other question I have of the day is um, well I'll I'll come back to that in a second. I'll come back to the question in a minute. Uh, Corey says he's still actively creating his first game design. It's about 90% finished. Just has to have to do some final art tweaks and rulebook layout before going to the manufacturer. Congratulations on doing that already, Corey. He says he decided to self-fund it and do a pre-order model like Stillmeyer Games. I hope that works for you, Corey. Uh, I, I, I certainly do. I, I, um, I still think that, that Kickstarter and crowdfunding is a good way of launching your first product. Um, but I appreciate you being inspired by what we do at Stillmeyer Games as well. I think we're able to do it because we have a built up audience, um, built up cash flow and things like that to make it happen. But uh, I think crowdfunding is pretty darn good for first time creators in particular. So um, yeah, I, happy to discuss that on my blog if you ever wanna talk about talk about that topic of, of what to go with for first time creator. And I do have a, a blog post about a month or so ago about things to think about if you are going to the pre-order or launch model instead of the crowdfunding model. But I applaud you for, for believing in your game um, and, and, and just going for it. That's a, that's a huge step. Congratulations on doing that. Aaron has some game ideas that he's working on. He spent, feels like he's spending too long in the idea phase. The idea phase is a really fun phase. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, the beginning of the creative phase. You aren't actually creating anything yet, but you are having fun with it. I enjoy the brainstorming ideation phase. And he says he's still excited about it either way. That's great that you're still excited about it. Ian says he's always writing. He has a screenplay with an agent. Congratulations on that, Ian. And editing another. He's also working on his YouTube channel for all the meeples. That's great. Yeah, it's fun. I, I love that in this era of, 
of, of blogs and podcasts and, and um, YouTube channels and things like that, that there's an outlet for creativity that you can just create something and put it out there. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just something that you can create and put out there and share with everyone while you're working on these things that take many, many steps and long-term planning and investment. I think the combination of the two, I think, is really helpful for me creatively. I don't know if the rest of you have experienced that as well. Brian is, he's reviewing some games right now for gameplay and accessibility. And he has articles on the way for Ashes Reborn, Wolves, and the Isle of Cats Explore and Draw. Brian also works with us as a proofreader specifically from the accessibility standpoint, like uh, uh, colorblind friendliness, icon friendliness, things like that. Scott's work in the idea stage as well, similar to Aaron. He says, one thing that concern, concerns me is balancing rewards. Can you talk about the process you went through to balance the individual reward cards in Wingspan? Great question, Scott. And I would say uh, that for the idea stage, I wouldn't say balancing is important at all. For the idea stage in particular, that... Uh, I, I think it's great that you're thinking about it, but I would almost set aside those thoughts for a little bit and just try to get something to the table because so much will change after you get a prototype, prototype at the table. Balance is uh, doesn't really matter at that stage. Um, as for Wingspan, I'm not the designer of Wingspan. Elizabeth Hargrave was the designer of Wingspan. I was coming at it from a development perspective to try to make it as fun, intuitive, and balanced as possible. But um, And so I guess balance is part of it. But, but Elizabeth had a giant spreadsheet that she uses and still uses to this day to balance out the different rewards, balancing like how many habitats can the bird go in? How many points is the bird worth? How strong is the bird's ability? How many eggs can it hold? All these different factors that go into a formula to balance the birds as best as possible. Um, my part of the process for those birds is oftentimes to come at it from the anecdotal feedback perspective, because sometimes you can have a formula like, formula like that and the formula can check out and show that a bird is balanced. But in reality, you find that players prefer that bird over other birds or they overvalue or undervalue it. And I think it's important to take that into account as well. So I think combining the, the formulaic spreadsheet side of balance with what is uh, how players feel about certain cards or certain mechanisms is part of what I focus a little bit more on and I think is really important to design as well. Let's see, I see more comments here. Uh, Julio is working on a fan-made expansion for Wingspan, the museum expansion. He says it features 130 extinct or critically endangered birds. That's awesome. Yeah, you've told me about that a little bit, Julio. He says it's giving him the courage to design a standalone game. We've got a lot of creative ideas for him. That's awesome. Yeah, I think this is a great example of um, something that we encourage for people to try is if there's a game that you love, especially new designers, if there's a game that you love, design a module for it or a little mini expansion for it um, not to sell, but to share with people on Board Game Geek, on the, on the game's Facebook group, things like that, as Julio will do with the museum expansion, for people to try and for you to dabble in game design. Because designing a game from scratch is pretty hard to do. Designing an expansion, still difficult, still takes a lot of work, but you already have the foundation of the game to work on. Um, and so I think that's a great way to kind of uh, test out game design by designing an expansion, a mini expansion or a module for an existing game or for Rolling Realms. Rolling Realms, I think, is a great uh, a playground for, for game design to play around with, to create a realm for Rolling Realms just for fun, to share it. Like uh, Mark, Mark's here in the in the live cast here. Mark has designed a lot of fan realms for Rolling Realms um, just to dabble in and to take a, a game that exists and design a fan realm for that game and uh, see, see what challenges await you with trying to fit the rules onto a single card to explain things with just a few icons on the cards, things like that. I think that's a fun design challenge. Corey is trying to start a game company. He posted his first print and play on his website last week. Congratulations on that, Corey. Feel free to share a link to that in the comments here if you'd like. Uh, Ian started a board game channel for fun. He says his wife and I also have ideas for a board game, although it has stalled a bit. That's great, Ian. That's awesome to hear. I didn't know you were, you were doing that. You have to feel free to share a link to that as well in the comments here. There was another show referenced above. Uh, Ian, Ian, you mentioned uh, For All the Meeples. Feel free to share a link to that as well um, in the comments here if people want to check that out. Julie is working on a medium weight game just to experience the design process and see if she can make a fun game for her family. I love that goal, Julie, that you're on uh, on, on the process. I, I think that's I think that's awesome. Um, I think sometimes the the 
Well, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, bemoan any goals, but I think sometimes if, if your goal is say your goal is to make a million dollars off a game, that is something that is well out of your control, but it is in your control to make a fun game for your family, or at least try to make a fun game for your family or get a game to the table that you're trying to make fun for your family. That is a very achievable goal, a great early step goal to try in the game design process. So I love that that is your goal for it. And the way you've said that, Julie, that's awesome. I try to keep that in mind myself too, that um, my goal when designing a game, sometimes I design games specifically to publish, of course, I, I, I run a publishing company, but sometimes I design a game just to dabble with a specific mechanism that I haven't gotten to work with before and just to see what happens with it. It's just kind of experiencing the design challenges for that mechanism. Um, knowing that that the, the goal is not to turn it into something greater, at least for not that specific idea. And that uh, it, that really helps me to set those those small goals, those small achievable goals, uh, some of the big daunting goals that go along with, with running a company like this. Chad says that the focus is having a little harder time because of the um, room is a little darker today. Yeah, actually, I do have a light on today, too. It's really dark without the light on. A little darker day in St. Louis today. Hopefully the focus is back now. It looks like I'm about 10 minutes behind on questions. Dan says he's in the process of creating a new stage adaptation of the horror film Pontypool here in Wales. The script is almost locked in and the design is starting soon. You have a comment there, but uh, let's see. And Dan continues the comment. Adaptation is something you know about when you consider adapting something again. It's taken us five years to get the screen to, to stage adaptation right. And it's already starting on another one. Congratulations on, on the work that you put into that, Dan. That's awesome. As for adapting like an existing intellectual property or an existing like a digital game into a into a tabletop game, um, it's something that uh, and that's I, I wouldn't say that I'd never do it again. I, I'd say that I'm I, I much less likely to try to do it again. I would say some after some some past experiences, which have been fruitful, which have been interesting and fun processes. Red Rising was one of them. I just played Red Rising last Wednesday, a game night. I love that game. I love that we made Red Rising the, the tabletop game. But uh, a lot of like legal challenges come with uh, adapting a game, uh, exact, adapting an existing intellectual property. You have less flexibility to do sometimes what's best for the game because of the constraints of that world or the characters or whatever you have in, in there. It's I think sometimes it's difficult to appeal to an existing audience rather than creating a new audience through a new world. So I think there are a lot of challenges there that make me hesitant to try it again, but uh, I'm I'm open to it. Tim says, does the change of ownership of Miniature Market affect Stillmeyer Games? It does not, no. I was a little worried about that myself because we use Miniature Market for warehousing and fulfillment in the US. They've done a great job for us over the last year. And when I heard they were selling, when Asmodee was selling Miniature Market to some other people, I was a little bit worried about that. But those people, are already know miniature market really well. They they um, are are already in on that company, so th there won't be there won't be any changes related to that change in ownership. I see people are chiming in about the focus now. Fortunately, uh, got it to work here. Molly says that they're working at uh, working away at their board game and also pursuing working on a new game as well. Their work was really intense during the winter months, but now time is opening up again. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, sometimes I, I find it's also nice to just take a break from a project and come back to it with fresh eyes, as long as I have clear notes so I don't forget everything that I had uh, worked on before. Mark says, am I open to doing an online version of the Stillmire Game Design Day to feature designers that are not able to come in? You know, Mark, we tried that. Uh, we, just, we tried a fully virtual online design day for uh, a few years ago over um, during the pandemic, the first year of the pandemic. And it was fine. It 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 is it is a it is a thing that you we can we could do for sure. Um, I think my 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 gut instinct is uh, to just make sure that the Stomeyer Games Discord channel is a place where people are able to do that, are able to play test their games. But I do understand that it's nice to have to say, okay, this is the day that we're doing it. Um, so keep that in mind. I it's. It's a lot of time to do it, and it's when we do Design Day, it is entirely to serve the attendees of Design Day. We there there isn't anything much other than goodwill and just good times that some of our games get out of it. So, so I'm saying it, it isn't a great use of business time for some of our games 
even though it is a special day on a personal level for those of us at Snowmart Games to experience that, to see people having fun, to build that sense of community. So um, to host a day, even a virtual day, uh, I, I don't know, it, it, it's a lot of time, but maybe it's something that we could help to coordinate a little bit and just encourage people to come and, and show up and try it. Um, we do have the, I, I guess, you know, we did it for the, the virtual design day a couple of years ago. So we kind of know how to do it. I'll have to remember how we did it then. So I'll keep that in mind, Mark. You're right. There are a lot of people that can't participate that in design day because it is local to St. Louis. Whereas if we had it virtual, it could it could work for, for other people. Corey says, so Corey is uh, creating a board game and he's planning to not use crowdfunding for it. And he says he debated Kickstarter, but his biggest concern with Kickstarter was the additional fees. It's only a thousand copies. And as long as I sell 250, I'll break even. I'm confident I can move 250 locally. Anything about that is just a bonus. That's a, that's a fun approach to it, Corey. I can completely understand that. And you're right. There are fees that go along with the Kickstarter campaign. Um, yeah, that's, that's entirely true. You're right. So Olivier is referencing, uh, Olivier says, I am still convinced that wing spam could be a great game of an extension that could allow us to integrate worm span and wingspan together. Um, so Olivier is referencing some of the worm span related memes that, that uh, people shared back in January and that I shared in a top 10 list on a video this past Sunday that you can feel free to check out here. I'll, I'll click over here so you can see it in the newsletter. Where do I have the newsletter? Here we go. Here's the newsletter over here. It looks like this, my top 10 favorite worm span memes. Um, here's worm spin right here. Here's worm spin itself. Here's scythe span. And there are uh, eight other worm span memes in this video, including some honorable, men honorable mentions that didn't have uh, visuals included with them. That was a fun video to make. Chad says, one of my favorite parts of scythe is the threat of combat. I feel like it's a great, it's great player interaction without using a specific mechanism. Was that this intended in the design or a happy accident? Uh, it was a happy accident, or it was something I discovered as I play tested side that I was more interested in the threat of combat, the tension of potential combat, than I was by players constantly bumping heads throughout the game. Um, so I, I mean, I went through many, many versions of combat inside until I realized what was best for it. And one of the biggest realizations for it, I'm remembering this because I have a wall behind this desktop here, and on the wall behind me when I designed side, it was covered in side art. And whenever I would go through a play test, I would end that play test by looking at that wall of art and trying to think, is what this game currently is reflecting the way this art makes me feel when I look at it? Because there's something that I feel when I look at Scythe's art. And I realized over time, looking at Scythe's art, there's actually very little combat happening in the art. There are a few combat scenes, but most of the scenes in Scythe are, include things that happen after a war, like mechs instead of tanks in this world, but mechs in cornfields and, and farm fields and uh, farmyards and things like that, like leftover mech machinery being uh, scrapped or, or used for other purposes in this world, not for combat. And so I try to keep that in mind that there's this threat, this, this idea that there was a time where there was war, war could still happen, but this isn't a war game. Uh, once I realized that I, I realized the importance of the threat of combat instead of combat itself in the game. Sam from McDavid Publishing saying, outside of game design creative pursuits, he's been 3D modeling and printing insert and storage solutions for his favorite games to help seeing if it'll help them get tabled more. That's cool. I've seen some people create some really cool uh, things via 3D printing. Corey said, uh, Corey mentioned that he has his, uh, his print and play up. It's at peoplewantgames.com. The game is called The Butterfly Braid. I like that name, Corey. And he, here's Ian sharing uh, the link to his YouTube channel. Thank you. George is saying that you, Facebook isn't notifying him anymore whenever I go live. Hmm. You know, I'm using StreamYard now to do this. So I think there it's possible there's a disconnect between this and Facebook. Uh, I'll have to check on that because I had to, due to the recent hacking of my personal account, I had to reconnect it or I disconnect it and then reconnect it. And I wonder if it is saying on my personal Facebook that I'm live and not on the um, book, not on the, the Summer Games Facebook page. I'll, I'll check that after. Or see. In fact, I can click over here right now and see what 
the Stelmar Games Facebook channel is looking at, or Facebook page is looking at right now. Oh, uh, right now it shows me live. I, I can see myself live on there right now. So it is at least appearing on the Stelmar Games Facebook page. It's just not alerting me right now. So I don't know why that is. Ray says he wanted to mention that he got to introduce Wingspan to his parents after buying the Vision Friendly card specifically for that purpose. I'm glad to hear that worked out, Ray, those Vision Friendly cards. Thank you for giving them a try. He says they had no trouble reading what was on the cards. That's the goal of them. I'm, I'm glad we were able to accomplish that with those cards. <clears throat> Corey says, did St. Louis get hit, hit with windstorms yesterday? He says the Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia tri-state got hit very hard, had winds excessive of 90 miles per hour. Wow. Lasted around two minutes and caused all kinds of destruction. Oh, no. I'm sorry to hear that, Corey, about your area, even though it sounds like you're fine. Um, but you don't have power at the house, so that's that's not fine. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Corey. There's also, there was an earthquake in Taiwan that looks like it was incredibly destructive in a certain specific part of Taiwan where around 300,000 people live, maybe 500,000. A lot of people live there. And uh, so I just wanted to say my heart goes out to, to anyone who's experiencing some of these natural disasters recently. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that. Julio says, would it be okay to share the BGG link for his museum expansion, his fan expansion for Wingspan? Uh, of course, absolutely. Yeah, you can share it here. Yeah, thanks for asking. Sam says, do you have a blog post or video where you share insight on why you designed Between Two Cities as your first non-Stelmeyer, why, why you signed it as your first non-Jamie designed Stelmeyer game? So a place here, let me see if I can pull up where you might find something like this. Um, so Sam, if you go to, I'll show my other screen here. I'll, I'll pull down your comment. If you go to our website and go to, um, here we go, blog, go to insights from our projects right here under blog. You can see stories from each of our projects dating way back, including Between Two Cities. I don't know. So here's some articles in Between Two Cities. I don't know if I talk about Between Two Cities here. There might be some other connected articles that I didn't link to. So I don't know necessarily if I have an article about it, um, but it might be there. It might be in those articles. The the long and the short version of the story is that uh, it isn't necessarily something that I even realized I wanted to do until it happened. So we, it, I. I think I started to realize that I have some game design talents, but there are lots of games that I am not good at designing. And I, at the time, we were thinking that we would we wanted some of our games to have a wide variety of different types of games. We eventually decided to focus on event games, like the main meat of a game night. But at the time, we were like, okay, let's have some short games, some long games, some I, I don't know, some party games, like, like one of each game genre at the company. Um, and at Gen Con one year, I heard that uh, Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley, who I knew very little, I knew just a tiny little bit of them, they stopped by and they said they were working on a game. And the hook of the game sounded pretty cool to me. And so they sat down and, and played it with us, um, or invited them to play it with us. They brought it by and we, we played it with them. And we ended up really, really liking it. And so I think it maybe it was in my head at the time that I that we were looking for games outside of the games that I would design at the company. And uh, this game happened to pop up and we, we kind of ran with it um, and, and signed it. So, yeah, that's kind of a haphazard, short form, short form version of that story. Sergio is waiting for some Expeditions expansion news. Yeah, I look forward to sharing that news uh, in, in a few months. Not, not today, but in a few months. Uh, let's see. Ian says he's a couple of fun video ideas he started. One is called Five and Diamond, has a top five and a top 10 in the same category. The other is Tales of the Tape and is a comparison video. Yeah, feel free to share links to those videos, Ian, uh, so we can see how they're going so far. I think that's the great thing about YouTube. You can have an idea, just put it up there and see how it goes, um, and then iterate on that idea. Uh, I think the important part is to actually put the video out there and see, see what it feels like, see how it goes to actually create it and put it out there and see how people respond to it. Oh no, up in Ontario, they're still being hit with major winds up there as too, 80 kilometers per hour. And I guess I didn't I didn't answer Corey's question. We did hit, get hit by a huge storm on Monday night. I think it was Monday night. Um, and it's been pretty windy. It's been pretty windy just in general lately, not winds of, of this caliber. 
of this speed, but we have been hit by some pretty strong winds recently. And the, the storm, uh, it was a huge lightning and hail storm on, on, I believe, Monday night. Maybe it was Sunday, Sunday or Monday night. Um, yeah, so I hope I, these... I, it's the Midwest. We get winds from time to time. I'm, I'm, I'm always a little bit worried about tornadoes and things like that. But I, I think, we, you know, we've seen these weather patterns change as climate change is getting worse and worse due to the the human element of how we're rapidly changing this planet. So hopefully we can continue to make a positive difference or I think weather is going to be really, really terrible in the future. I am, I'm actively worried about that. And try to to do what what little I can, but you know the little things add up when a lot of people are doing them to um, to have a positive impact on on climate change. Um, yeah, yeah, kind of a dire topic there. Uh, my question of the day, I'll come up back to comments in a, in a second. Completely unrelated to this, but my question of the day, someone asked this on the YouTube channel the other day, and I thought it could make an interesting video. They requested a video about it, and uh, the question was, what? What game that you own or what game or games do you own do you really love the graphic design in? Do you think they did a great job in the graphic design? The graphic design is partially like the icons and how cards are laid out, how the uh, the, the, ga the game board itself is laid out, all the, the materials that you, that you interact with, how that, that layout is. Part of it is also the user interface. What is it about the user interface the graphic designer created that is very friendly to you? That means that you don't need to reference the rule book very often, that everything that you need to look at and understand is right there on the table in front of you. Um, and part of it is also tied to the rule book layout. Graphic design is part of that layout as well. There's also deeper layers to graphic design, like preparing print files so the printer, the manufacturer can actually print them uh, per their specs. That's a little harder to see. But yeah, let me know what, if there are any games that stand out where you're like, I think this graphic design was done superbly well. And this makes the game, this enhances the game's experience for me or my experience of the game. It's a tough list for me to think about because I, I look at the games on my shelf and honestly, if a game doesn't have good graphic design, it really stays on my shelf for a long time. Like if the user interface isn't very user friendly, it's going to be fairly unlikely that I'll get that game to the table. Also, I should note that graphic design is different than art. So what's on like the background of a card, um, the, the art is, uh, is, is something that a graphic designer incorporates, but it isn't something that they are responsible for. So it's not part of the, um, that's not part of the graphic design aspect of the game. Ian asks, what is my perfect game night lineup? My perfect game night lineup. I think it depends on the board, on the game night, and of course, who I'm with. Uh, I wanna play games that, that everyone at the table is excited to play. Um, I often like, if I have the choice, if I have complete control over a game night, I often like to start with a game that everyone can participate in. So a larger group game that will definitely end after around 20 minutes. And ideally even one that people can drop, can drop into as they arrive in case people are arriving a little bit late. And then I like to shift towards oftentimes a medium weight, a medium weight game, you know, a game that will last between 60 to 90 minutes, at least at the game night that I host. Um, that 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 game is wide open. Whatever that game is, is, is wide open. And oftentimes, I like to end the night with a little, a shorter game. A, you know, a little filler game, maybe a trick taking game. I I have fun ending games with, ending game nights with those types of games as well. That's a fun question, though. I, I like if you have complete control over a game night. What is the what are the types of games and the order in which you would play them with your gaming group? Board game family man says I've been. I've wanted to try making some tabletop gaming videos, but I kept thinking that I had nothing to add to the conversation and the space is already too crowded for a new person. You know, I, I, I hear that. I, I understand where you're coming from that with that. And it is a crowded space. I think, again, it depends on your goals. Are you, are you trying to, you know, what, what would be your goal for creating a YouTube channel? For example, when I created, uh, when I started talking about game design on the, the YouTube channel a long time ago, uh, the goal wasn't to build a bunch of subscribers. The goal wasn't to um, to have a, a way to market Stillmire Games. The goal was purely that I didn't have an outlet to talk about game design with people other than the people in my immediate vicinity. vicinity, vicinity. Um, and I wanted an outlet for that. I like talking about games. I like talking about game design. I like talking about my favorite things in games. And uh, so I, I just turned on the camera and started talking about Robinson Crusoe, I think it was the first game. I was really excited about a mechanism in Robinson Crusoe and I wanted to talk about it. So 
I think that is, that is a, I mean, that's my, that was my goal. Your goal might be different, but I think that is a valid reason for someone to uh, create content just to have an outlet for it. Um, and I guess there is a difference between creating something like that. Like I, I could have filmed that video and not shared it, just made it private, just made it for myself to talk through some game design. But I did want to have a discussion about it. My, my, the purpose was to start a discussion and hope that at least a few other people would chime in and share their thoughts on that game or share other games that have that mechanism. So with that goal in mind, that was enough. That was enough for me. Um, I think you're right. Like I, I have the same doubt when I create content sometime, like why would I create this blog post or this podcast or this video when there are so many other blog posts or videos or podcasts about the same topic. But um, I guess that isn't exactly what motivates me. It doesn't, what motivates me is to have that outlet to start a conversation about something that I am passionate about. So I, I totally hear what you're saying though. And I think if your goal is at least partially to build something that other people will engage with, that uh, I think it's great to be aware of what's already out there because people already do have access to that. And um, to maybe play around with some, some different formats that are exciting to you and fun for you to create that aren't already out there so that that engagement um, might be might be more likely for people to, or that content might be more likely for people to engage with. Yeah, long answer to a, 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 a well-formed comment, really. I, I think that's something that I think a lot of content creators or new or potential content creators ask themselves. And I think it's a good thing for us to ask ourselves. Oh, wow, Corey says he's in Cincinnati. He had cars floating in the road from the flooding there. We had a flash flood warning in St. Louis, but it it uh, didn't add up to anything, at least in my area here in St. Louis. Luke says, did you ever think about putting encounter cards randomly in the main deck in Expeditions? Uh, yeah, I see. So you're asking about the concept of encounter cards. So the idea in Expeditions is that the encounters are the locations themselves. So the encounters are very much in the game, just not where you're exactly expecting them to be. Um, so I did play around with other ideas of putting, I guess, the more encounter cards, the types of encounter cards that people expect to see in a game like Expeditions in the encounter deck. Um, and I, I have some ideas that for potential expansions, but I haven't gravitated towards them all that much. So the, the idea that I played around with is to have a card in the deck, because card in, in Expeditions, you are, you're very rarely drawing from the top of the deck. More often, you're gaining cards that are face up among the tableaus, uh, among the, the locations. And the idea that I've had is to have um, kind of ongoing encounters where when you reveal them, when you reveal an on uh, ongoing encounter, you put it in between the locations as normal. And it kind of represents something happening in that area that you could deal with if you wanted to. A problem is it kind of leads, it definitely leads to more rules because you have to explain like how and when do I interact with this encounter card? How, how do I do that? There's nothing in the game's interface saying when I can do that. Um, and as I started with, the encounters and expeditions are the locations themselves. You, you are revealing something as you reveal a location that is happening at that location, and you are deciding how you want to interact with that, that location. Are you going to solve a quest there or complete a quest? Are you going to, to, to gather stuff from that location? Are you going to actively use it? Um, are you going to remove corruption from it? So a few different ways to in, interact with those encounter-style locations. Um, yeah. Yeah, long-winded way of, of saying that there are encounters and expeditions, just not exactly where you were expecting them, I think. Mark says, totally random question. Without minding any constraints, which one of your games will you expand further in a would you expand further in a heartbeat, even if you've already done that with a game? Hmm. Would I expand further in a heartbeat? Interesting question, Mark. I see I, my answer a little bit is I don't know if I would. Um my my instinct isn't is isn't typically to expand a game that we've already made because typically when I make a game I think of it as complete. Um, I'm not I'm not designing it for the potential to expand it. I understand what you're saying with, without minding any constraints, but I would say almost my answer is if I I probably wouldn't I probably wouldn't design any expansions for our games. Um, if I know that's looking down on expansions a little bit, especially since I have an Expeditions expansion in the works. We have an Apier expansion in the works. Um, I'm really happy with those expansions and what they add to the game. But uh, but I kind of wish the game would just stand by itself. 
uh, for, for a long time. Uh, that's kind of my, that's at least my goal when I create a game, to create a game that is lasting in itself and self-contained where, uh, where people can continue to discover it, even just with the game, not, not needing any extra boost from an expansion for people to, to bring people into the game's world. Um, and where the game is uh, awesome, just in the core game itself, that people don't feel like they need to add more or need to change anything, need to fix anything through an expansion. That's always my goal, I would say, when I, when I create a new game, whether I'm the designer or the developer for it. Races, I think the Dune Imperium games have incredibly understand. So there's a question about graphic design. What is some great graphic design? And I think Ray is answering this from the perspective of when you look at this game, you can understand a lot of how it works just by looking at their graphic design, which makes the game easier to teach. Dune Imperium is the example he says here. He says it's also very effective at working with potential color blindness, which is great and very important. Oh, wow. Susanna said that they had, out where Susanna lives in St. Louis, they had a uh, a tornado confirmed just north of her, and she was in the basement. Her husband saw her husband Joe saw lots of branches and debris on the road on his way home. That's scary, Susanna. I'm glad everyone was okay. Wow. Uh, Director Dan says he loves Ian O'Toole's graphic design. He says I recently brought, bought Ra and found the iconology so clear. I also think he does great work on making Lacerda's heavy games feel very clear. Yeah, that's a, a great talent when a graphic designer can make a complex game feel more intuitive or as intuitive as possible based on the user user interface. One of the things that I think Ian did really cleverly in Raw, and this is about layout in the new Raw from 25th Century Games, is that Raw has some tiles that you keep for the entire game and some tiles that you wipe clean at the end of each round. Um, or Epoch, I think they're called Epochs in, in the game. And what Ian did, this is so obvious, but also I, I don't think it had been done before in Raw, is that he on the for the player mat one side of the player mat the left side of the player mat are tiles i believe that's the side of tiles where you keep them for the entire game the other side the tiles that you put on the right side of the player mat are tiles that are wiped away maybe it's the opposite it's one of those two but one side is wiped one side is keep i think it was so clever for him, for him to do that to create the player mat in such a way that it had room for all the tiles on either side each side of the player mat explains what the tiles do and it's a clear wipe. You know that you just wipe all those tiles away. You don't have to remember which side, which tiles go on which side, things like that. Really, really clever from the Eno tool. Um, Joshua mentioned Kanban EV. Also, I believe Eno tool did that one as well. I should make notes about these because I will lose these notes. So uh, let's see, Dune Imperium. Imperium, um, Kanban. I haven't played Kanban in a while. And just, uh, I'll mention Ra specifically, because I think Ian did a great job with that one. Dice Throne, yeah. So Gavin Brown, at uh, who who does a lot of the graphic design and business stuff for um, for the company that makes Dice Throne. I'm blanking on the company now. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the company. What is the company that makes Dice Throne? Um, it's Gavin's company, Roxley, Roxley Games. Um, Gavin is a, a, an incredibly talented graphic designer. I think that he does a fantastic job with his games. So I will mention uh, Dice Throne. Yeah, that's a great one. Great intuitive graphic design there. Chad mentions Unmatched. He says the, I did, I did put Dice Throne out there. Thank you, Julio, for mentioning that. Here is Unmatched. He says he likes the icons, the board's line of sight system is great, not to mention the style of the graphic design is creative and matches the amazing art. Unmatched. Yeah. Luke has a good way of saying that. I think if you want to start a YouTube channel, just do it. I have a boarding channel, but it's mostly just for me. I think that's a fair way to look at that, Luke. And one thing I think you'll discover if anyone is considering starting a, a blog, a podcast, a YouTube channel, anything like that, an Instagram, whatever you want to create, uh, content creation, is uh, I think that actually this is the best, far better than what I said. Just start it. Just try it. I think you will find very quickly if it is something that you are enjoying or something that you want to tweak or something that you're simply not enjoying, but you won't know that until you actually start it. Um, everything is hypo hypothetical until you actually start it. It doesn't need to be perfect. Your first video, go back and look at my early videos. They are, in fact, in my videos still aren't perfect. I just turn on the camera and talk. They're, they'll never be perfect. But you can compare the early videos to the new videos. I, I uh, And you can see some of the little enhan enhancements, quality of life enhancements that I've added over the years. And that's okay. It's okay that I have older videos that aren't as polished as the newer videos. That's totally fine. 
Uh, and Ian, I, I like the way Ian says it too. A YouTube channel is like any other artistic pursuit. Do it for yourself first and then others second. Yeah, that's a, a, a neat way to look at it. Yeah. Chad mentions Garpill, Garfield games. Garp, I always mess it up. Not It's not Grapphill, Chad. Uh, Gar, Garpill games uses the same graphic design across their line of games. Yeah, I really like the consistency for them. I always think of um, Garpill and Red Raven as doing that. Their, their consistency, I think, is really, really clever. Sam says he really likes Carnegie's graphic design. He says it's very clean and, in his opinion, very easy to read. Um, I never feel like I consult the rules when I table it, which is impressive due to its weight and icon dependence. Carnegie, yeah. Makes me think a little bit of Terra Mystica. I really like the look of the icons in Terra Mystica. I think Terra Mystica does a great job. Our graphic designer is Christine Santana. I think she does a great job too um, with graphic design. And I like, I wanted to mention too, that I like that Board Game Geek, maybe a year or two ago, they added the option for you to add the graphic designer to the, the credits, which I think is really important. The graphic designer does so much work on these games, and I'm glad that they finally get credit for that. Corey says, any favorite April Fool's posts for other games? A uh, Phantom Fight Games did this dirty and teased a complete reprint of Battlestar Galactica and all expansions. Oh, Hopefully, maybe that won't actually be a joke. I don't know. I that that's the type of April Fool's joke I, I prefer not to do. I um, maybe people knew it was a joke right away, but um, but I did see that Roxley Games they did a chocolate dice, so they did a chocolate related thing too. I don't think they're real though, like our chocolate. Um, there's one other. Oh, the uh, uh, Ravensburger. They did something involving a scent, the scent of a puzzle. I think, and they had a video about that on their Instagram that I thought was really well done. Did anyone else see anything on April Fools from board game companies that you thought was pretty clever? William says he likes the graphic design of Iki. I K I. It looks great and easy to understand at a glance. I think many language independent games shine in this regard. I'm glad you mentioned that because I do have a video about language uh, independent games. I need to look at that list to see what makes them, what makes them uh, see if any games of that list should be on this list of games with great graphic design. Hilda mentions Ryan Lockett's games. That's Red Raven Games. Totally agree there. Uh, Aaron mentioned uh, Keymaster for Parks and Caper Europe. I agree. I think Parks, both games. Parks is the one that's still on my shelf. Uh, Parks has wonderful graphic design. I actually really like the, the graphic design of Solkin, too. I need to look to see who the graphic designer is for that game. Um, Ian is keeps trying to paste this link. I don't know if you all can see it, but here's what it looks like, I think, on the screen. Hopefully you can see that. In case you want to check out Ian's YouTube channel. I don't think I can copy and paste it like I was hoping to do here. Hey, Steve says his favorite graphic design is always something that is somewhat simple where the gameplay pieces are, are but also complex enough elsewhere. Century Gollum Edition is one of his favorites. Cute and beautiful. Century Gollum. I mentioned that. I actually just did a video about Stone Spine Architects yesterday. And there was a little graph design element that I thought was so clever. I mentioned in the video, you'll see it soon, where there, there are three tokens of different shapes and there are cards that come out that tell you with their silhouettes which tokens to place where using these different shapes. And it isn't entirely that they use different cards to have those different shapes on them, but it's the idea that they used three different token shapes to, uh, to ensure that there are a variety of tokens that, that appear in the game. Um, through these, the, pairing these different shapes with the cards. I thought that was a, a really clever little hook there. So I think that the graphic design at um, at Thunder, Thunderworks, actually Thunderworks and Thundergrip both have pretty good graphic design. Stone Spine, I'll also, also mention Thunder Griff. I think they have good graphic design. Corey at Blue Falcon mentions underdog games, uh, like trekking through history, trekking through the national parks. I agree. Yeah, they. I played a few of their games, and the the trekking series does have great graphic design. Chad says, "I saw this Dragon Shuffle game from Forest Shuffle on April first. Not sure if it's real or not. I'm pretty sure that is not real. Yeah, there was a Fantasy Flight also had Fish with Knives announcement. It was hilarious. I didn't see that one." Justin says, would you be willing to provide advice to graphic designers who would like to explore work in the gaming industry? Are there forums or sp specific ways to find work? 
Um, let me show you a place to, so that I have some gen, I have a general answer here, Justin, that, that, um, that I might get a little bit more specific with, but let me pop over to my other screen and show you, if you look at, where do I have this? If you look at our job application, so go to about and go to job application on our website. And this has a bunch of articles about how to get involved in the game industry from the perspective of different professions, including graphic design. Um, and a few of these articles in, in particular, flatter your way hiring in a world of volunteers. I think some of the best ways to get involved in the game design industry are to showcase your talents uh, using something that you are excited about um, in a way that is respectful to the, to the, or at least not offensive to the company that, that, uh, that you were trying to work with. For example, uh, for graphic design in particular, if you if there's a game that you love that you think could be enhanced by your graphic design, um, and I'm not saying that entirely correctly, but if if you, there's a game that you love that I think that you think your graphic design could do something special with, um, post on some board game related forums, tabletop related forums. There are plenty of them on 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 uh, on Board Game Geek, of course, and on Facebook. Post your version of the board from that game or the uh, the player map from that game or the car or card from that game. Showcase what you would do with your skills with that game so that uh, for so the game publishers can conceptualize and can see what your talents would add to their company if they had you working on graphic design for them. Uh, I think that's a great way to do it. And you can even do it if you go on some of those forums like game design forums on Facebook. You can see people posting card layouts that they're experiment experimenting with. And one thing that you can do on those forums on those threads is to go on and take some of those designs that a designer is working on just a card layout and post your version of it and show them what your talents can lend to that sort of card design when a, when a designer or a publisher is going through that process of oh how should we lay out this card so i guess be being active in sharing your talents through examples for either existing games or in progress games that people are posting about i think is a great way to get your foot in the door of the game design industry Great question, uh, Justin. Hey, Steve mentioned Andrew Bosley. His style is one of a kind. So Andrew is actually an artist. Andrew does do some, I, he does work, he does create some icons. So uh, him and Mr. Cuddington, I think are artists and, and Eno Tool. They're all artists that also create icons, but um, Ian, I think Ian might be the only one of them that does the graphic design for the game as well. But Andrew and Mr. Cuddington, who, are great at creating icons don't go i guess they do create some layout too there, there is some overlap with them but they are primarily artists but i will mention them because i think they are fantastic um bosley and cuttington great great icon design for sure and good with layouts rocky says for april fools cg had an offer to build a life-size cathedral for kuntna hora that's a great little tweak there a fun little uh, joke for them to do there Alex says, oh, I don't know why I'm still sharing my screen. Alex says, do you have any issues in your games where graphic design had to be modified for localization in other languages or cultures? Great question, Alex. Uh, the Maybe the main thing that happens is that there are, uh, I just found a pretty big bug on my wall. Got to take care of that. Um, there are some languages that uh, where the text takes up considerably more space than English text. And so if I've crammed, or if we've crammed text into a small space at 10 point font, that it creates a challenge for like our German partners. So you might see German cards that have a much bigger text box as a result. And so I try to keep that in mind for our localization partners. Yeah. Jeff and Monica have a comment on blogs, YouTube channels, et cetera. I love more long form board game discussions with the designers and publishers themselves, kind of like the board game design lane lab channel, more channels like this are definitely welcome. And Jeff, you know, I can relate to this a little bit in terms of podcasts. This is totally personal preference, but I really like podcasts that uh, that are at least around thirty to forty minutes about uh, about where they talk about the game for a, where a single game, where they talk about a single game, whether it's by themselves with a co-host, with a designer, with anyone they want to bring in, or if it's just themselves, where they do a deep dive into what makes that game special or what makes the game, or constructive criticisms about that game as well, but a deep dive into the game. I personally want very little time spent on how the game works, or they can 
intermingle the explanation of how the game works with that total uh the, the total uh discussion about it but i really like those deep dives discussions about a single game and the reason i like this is that i often work out while listening to podcasts and i think people have different versions of this you might be in the car listening to a specific podcast or you might whatever it is um it's often for i think a, a longer period of time and people often listen to podcasts at higher speeds i listen to them at usually 1.8 or two times speed um and so i want something that's a little bit longer so that in the middle of the workout i don't have to stop and find a different podcast about a different topic and but i also like it for searchability where i'm searching through podcasts about a specific game i can say okay i want to i want to listen to every podcast about sleeping gods i want to hear what people are thinking about sleeping gods um and i don't just want like five minutes that i have to find in the middle of another podcast about sleeping gods i want people to talk about that game for 30 to 40 minutes i want to deep dive into people's thoughts about what makes the game special, what they would like to see different in the game, things like that. Not even necessarily a review, just a deep dive discussion about it. And I hear, it, Jeff, you are saying um, long format is what I'm, I'm piggybacking off of here, but also you're liking that designers and publishers can chime into that discussion. So honestly, for me, whoever they want to bring into those discussions is great as long as it's longer form and not just like a podcast that talks about a bunch of different games throughout the podcast. I think a compromise for this, or not a compromise, but a format for this that I found that kind of works for it, uh, that I enjoy, is the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, because they do spend a while talking about the main game for that episode. They, they feature the game, that game, in the name of the episode. I think that works really well. It makes it easier to find or to search for. They also have a, a part at the beginning of every episode where they talk about a variety of games. And they'll go, they'll spend time on the, all those games. And I do appreciate that banter portion of the episode before they get to the, the, the meat of the episode. So I think, and their podcasts are definitely long form podcasts. They they last almost three hours sometimes. I usually listen to that that banter part and then the the main game that they're featuring for that podcast. Um, yeah, that's a long rant about long form content, but it is something that I value particularly in podcast form. Hey, Steve says Ivy Studios did an entire video where they develop a game in real time on a live stream. That's cool. That's a neat little tweak for them to do that. Um, as I'm saying this, I, I'm realizing that I don't really do. Or actually, no, I kind of do, uh, not intentionally, but I have long form podcasts, but not about a specific topic. Like this this uh, video that you're listening to right now, some of you might be listening to it as a podcast in the future because we do offer it in podcast audio form if you want to listen to it there. But it isn't about one specific game. I, I like that focus on one specific game where I could spend 30 to 40 minutes listening to someone talk about going in depth about a specific game. And there are some podcasts that do this. Other than um, Secret Cabal, there is... Uh, I mean, there are definitely other podcasts that do this. There's one that I subscribe. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it's, I think one of the participants in it is John from John Gets Games. That's one that where they do a deep dive into it that I really, really like. Anyway, you all have given me some great answers about graphic design here that I really appreciate. Feel free to check out our chocolate of the day over at Crown Candy Kitchen. There are links in the newsletter that you can find. Over on our news, if you don't know where our newsletter is, go to news and you can get, you can check out all of our past newsletters here on the news page down here and check out what we're doing this month with that chocolate for April Fool's. It is a real product that we, that we, that they, we didn't make it, but they actually made it at Crown Candy and they'll be selling them through April 8th at Crown Candy. Yeah. But thank you all for joining me for this episode. I love the comments. I love your thoughts, your questions, and I look forward to next week's episode. I'll see you then. Take care. Have a great week. Stay safe from all these wind, all the wind, and I'll hopefully see you next week. Take care.